Hello there, my very good friends. Andy Murray here for What Culture Wrestling, because let's be honest, who the hell else are you going to get for a video with the word push? in the title. Anyway, WrestleMania 37 has just happened, it was a really good show across both evenings, and this is often considered WWE's season ender as well. After this we get a whole new season of programming, as WWE themselves often call it, the slate gets wiped clean, new wrestlers are pushed, while some others might fall down the ladder. Today we're going to focus on the positive side of that equation, having a look at the men and women set to soar to the stratosphere after the grandest stage of them all. So without further ado, let's dive into this bloody thing. I'm Andy for What Culture Wrestling, and here are 10 WWE superstars set for a big push after WrestleMania. Number 10. Bailey. Bailey had bugger all to do at WrestleMania 37, and that was a real shame and a real bugbear for a lot of people. She was, after all, one of the MVPs of WWE's Empty Arena era. Yeah, on WrestleMania, she didn't wrestle, she didn't even do a ding dong hello, she just hung out a little bit with Titus O'Neil and Hulk Hogan, she annoyed Michael Cole, and then she got beaten up by the Bella Twins, which didn't go as well as WWE would have hoped with the crowd who booed Nikki and Brie. There's not a lot there to suggest that she's going to be elevated, that she's going to be pushed all the way back to the top, but how could it be any worse than what we got at WrestleMania? Literally anything would be considered a push after that terrible, terrible evening, and you know, with Bianca Belair now as SmackDown Women's Champion, that's a pretty interesting feud. They've wrestled already, but not at the absolute highest level, and I think a lot of people would want to see that. We might not get it immediately, but definitely down the line. Number 9. The Viking Raiders Returning to action on the Raw after WrestleMania for the first time in 8 months were Eric and Ivar. Now, we kind of knew that they would be coming back soon when we saw them in that weird opening segment of Night 1 on WrestleMania when they were standing there with a bunch of other people in their gear. The interesting thing about that was that Ivar has been injured for the past 8 months. He hasn't been on TV, he hasn't done anything, and there he was just standing in the lineup. Jinder Mahal was there as well, but he's not really showed up yet. Either way, the Viking Raiders were in action on Raw. They beat uh, Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin in around five minutes. The Raw tag team division could use some interesting teams coming in to build up and challenge AJ Styles and Omos. These guys are one of the best at that. They've never really been booked the best on the main roster, but hopefully now that they're back, they're fresh, they're exciting, they can push on. Number 8. Mandy Rose Now, <laughs> the word push in this situation, that's P-O-O-S-H by the way, is kind of interpretational because what's about to happen to Mandy Rose, you and I might not consider a push, but Vincent Mann almost certainly will. We've already seen from the Raw after WrestleMania that after slipping and landing on her arse on the way to the ring at Mania, Mandy's gimmick is now person who falls over. She's in a feud based around that immediately. Her and Dana Brooke versus Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler. It's all going to be about people slipping on banana peels. So yeah, the presentation's going to suck a lot of the time, but you just know that Vince McMahon was pissing himself laughing deep into the night when he saw her fall over at Mania. He's going to milk this cow for all he can. It's going to be worse than Titus World Slide, if you can imagine such a thing. So get ready for it, they'll be on TV a lot. And the silver lining is that, hey, maybe Mandy and Dana will get the tag team titles out of this. Who knows? Number 7. Damien Priest The whole point of getting Bad Bunny on WWE television in the first place was the same as pretty much every other piece of modern celebrity booking. You want to bring in a wider audience. You want to bring in Bad Bunny's fan base who will then catch foot attention of Damien Priest and go, oh, Wow, that guy with him is really cool as well. So hopefully WWE are able to do that. We've heard reports that the company wants to transform Damian Priest into the next big star for their Spanish-speaking audience. They've failed at that in the past, but Priest is a big dude. He's super athletic for a guy of his size. He's charismatic, he can talk, he's got a great look, he's got a lot going for him. It is a shame that WWE decided to immediately 50-50 him on this week's episode of Raw, that being said, but I think he's set up for a nice little run, maybe even with a mid-card title. Number 6. 
Almost. And I guess by extension, AJ Styles. I mean, look at the guy, right? Look at Almost. Look at how large this man is. Look at the sheer dimensions of this big beefy boy. A legitimate seven foot three inches. Vince McMahon was always going to shine a spotlight on this dude as soon as Vince felt that he was ring ready. And at WrestleMania, he was a lot of fun. He's a proper old school lumbering giant who can't necessarily do the athletic things that we see from like a Lance Archer or a Keith Lee, but can just stand there, let smaller guys bounce off him, throw them around, put them away with his boot on their chest. There's an art to that. There's a real skill in booking around a wrestler's limitations and doing things the old school giant way. So I'm looking forward to seeing what's next for Amos and AJ. They're the Raw Tag Team Champions. They could have a fun little run. And at the end of the day, you know, when this run finally ends, you're going to get almost squashing AJ like a bug. So that could be a lot of fun to watch as well. Number five, Cesaro. I'm probably setting myself up for failure here because how many times have we looked at Cesaro over the past decade and gone, hey, that guy should get a push. But it really felt like the start of something for this guy. Finally at WrestleMania 37, he beat Seth Rollins in an awesome all action match. And the way he celebrated afterwards really showed how much it meant to him to finally win the big one. Now, Lord knows what the immediate future holds for Cesaro, but there are a lot of options. If you want to use him as like a secondary title challenger for Roman Reigns, I think he'd do a really great job and that would be an awesome pay-per-view match. Um, but you could also slot him in elsewhere. You could have him continue the Rollins feud if you want. I mean, sometimes things get a little repetitious in WWE, but I'm not going to complain about another match of that caliber, and I'm sure you guys aren't either. Regardless, there are plenty of options if WWE want to make Cesaro a bigger deal, and they absolutely should, because he's one of the best bald guys ever. And I include Phil Mitchell in that. High praise. Number four, Big E. Now, yes, I'm aware Big E lost to Apollo Crews in around six minutes at WrestleMania, but failing upwards is a thing in pro wrestling. You don't necessarily have to like go further and further down the card. If you lose, some people lose and then they take an immediate step up. And speaking of taking an immediate step up, who else? on the SmackDown roster at the moment feels like a better long-term babyface person to take the Universal title off Roman Reigns than Big E after he put away Daniel Bryan and Edge at the same time at WrestleMania. I don't think there is a better option than Big E. That run towards the top, that run towards deep Roaning Reigns, which is what I'm predicting right here, right now. You can shout at me when I'm wrong, but that run will be slow. It'll take a while. It'll be built up over a course of months, but the process should begin immediately, and I'm looking forward to seeing it take shape. Number three, Alexa Bliss. So The Fiend versus Randy Orton was a thing that happened, and <laughs> Something you can say about it, I guess, objectively, is that the person who made the biggest difference in that match, the decisive person in that match, was Alexa Bliss, who distracted The Fiend, Randy Orton hit the RKO, Randy wins. But I don't think coming out of that match, anyone is better set up to go on some kind of big run than Alexa. WWE love this Alexa playground stuff. I think it's strange uh, myself, but they're really into it. She had a focus segment on this week's episode of Raw. There's plenty of fresh stuff to do with her and Bray Wyatt. She seems to have established a level of control over him. It seems Bray Wyatt sees uh, images of, of uh, Sister Abigail or something in that goop covered fit. It, it's a whole lot of weird supernatural stuff, but I think Alexa's focus is gonna continue and with WrestleMania and the Raw after Mania as evidence, get even bigger. Number two, Braun Strowman. At WrestleMania 37, Braun Strowman proved that Braun can indeed trump brains when he ended a feud built around how stupid he apparently is by killing Shane McMahon inside a cage. It was a fun match. It got fun, actually, I should say, after Shane took that ridiculous, crazy bump off the top of the cage. Then he got beat, but there was also Braun tearing through the wall. It was a hoot. It over-delivered for me. Now, I'm well aware, of course, that Strowman lost a number one contender's match on this week's episode of Raw, the Raw after WrestleMania. But I don't think that matters too much. He wasn't pinned in that match. Randy Orton was pinned, so that kind of keeps him safe a little bit. And I think over the coming weeks and months, we are going to see Strowman built up, kept protected, booked relatively strongly, so he can maybe step up and challenge for the WWE title, whether it's worn by Drew McIntyre or Bobby Lashley 
coming out of WrestleMania Backlash. Great Balls of Fire, end of the line, 2021 in your house. And at number one, Charlotte Flair. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? Uh, on the Raw after WrestleMania, who else comes out and immediately inserts herself in the Raw Women's title picture than Charlotte Flair? She's a heel again, she's got a new attitude, she cut that mic drop promo, which was really, really good, and then she beat up both Asuka and Rhea Ripley. It looks like, for the meanwhile, the Raw Women's title scene is gonna revolve around the three of them. That's a good group of wrestlers, three of the absolute best in the division, in the entire company, if you ask me, and I think that for the next logical step in Rhea Ripley's star making process, if we get to SummerSlam and she's still the champion, her going over Charlotte Flair is a very good step, particularly after WrestleMania 36. Um, will it happen? Who the hell knows? They might just throw the belt back on Charlotte immediately because they love doing that. But we'll see. I just get the impression that WWE is going to be a bit more progressive with the booking of this feud. So let's see how it pans out. Anyway guys, that's it. A big old list of wrestlers who are going to get that rocket strapped push after WrestleMania 37. Head on down the comment section and make fun of the way I pronounce the word push if you want. But tell us what you think as well. Who's going to be elevated? Who isn't going to be elevated? Arguments, insults, throw them all down there. You can also like, share, subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Then follow us on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE and myself at Andy H. Murray, where remember, you can tell me how wrong I am. Goodbye.